Um, I just wanted to say before I start into my little slide deck um, that I wanted to I wanted to do a couple of thank yous. Um, so I definitely wanted to thank you, Daniel and Nicole and the other organizers of this conference. I think um, I was highly impressed that you pulled it off. Not that I doubted any of your persistence or abilities, but um, for a couple of reasons, right? So the most obvious is that um, there is a little bit of chaos in 2020 and a lot of things I think probably were not what we all expected, um, but mostly because um, the OER community is such an interesting and diverse and strong community. And these kinds of communities really Really do require very persistent and understanding um, sort of leadership and organizers. And so I think that um, I am so excited that this conference is happening, that it is community led, but that um, the, the organizers really did a good job of getting community voice and participation. So um, what a really fun um, conference. And I also wanted to thank um, everyone for actually attending, um, not because, um, you know, coming and sitting in front of a Zoom screen is you know, hard or not hard, but I think, um, you know, continuous professional development, um, you know, refining your craft, um, being better instructors, um, thinking about policy. Um, these are all, I think, because all of us in this community are really committed to serving students in the US better. And so thank you for persisting through this crazy year um, being here and actually, um, I think, still bringing a lot of fun to this. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to run through about a dozen slides very quickly. Um, those of you who know me know that I um, do tend to talk very fast. And so I will apologize. Um, please um, ping me in the chat or let the Q and let the moderators know um, if I am going too fast or not covering the right topics that you want to hear about. So um, what I think the topic that we proposed was just how to think bigger about OER. And I'm a very simple kind of person. So we'll go with big, bigger, and biggest. Um, and let's see, how do we, oh no. Okay, so great. So I just wanna sort of add on, I don't know who writes those. I guess I wrote that at one point, the little bio. Um, I feel a little old um, because I wanted to, I think what Nicole had written, had I think bullied me into writing in it there is that it's my actual third presidential transition. I started my career in the federal government at the Department of Labor right when the Bush Obama transition was happening. Um, I was around for the Obama Trump um, transition and now I think um, at some point there will be a Trump Biden transition which I will also be part of. Um, and it's been a really in interesting and rocky ride. Um, I think interesting is a better word than rocky because it always is rocky but rocky is not either good or bad. Um, and recently I was actually having a conversation with um, some new um, staff that I onboarded to my team um, who were actually asking about sort of periods of uncertainty and instability. Um, and the piece of advice that I gave to them is that um, no matter what the circumstances are, you know, even if there wasn't an election this year and it was just the pandemic, um, there will always be things that um, we don't predict or plan for. Um, and the key thing to, I think, surviving or weathering all of these is to stay focused on work that has lasting impact. Um, leveraging the opportunities that do present themselves to you and making sure that um, you use the privileges that you have to provide opportunities for those who do not. Um, and so that's sort of on point with the theme. The Office of Edu I am a senior policy advisor in the Office of Educational Technology. Um, and our key values here are that we believe that educational opportunities should be available to all learners. And what we want to do is make sure that the technology that is available can have its greatest impact when it focuses on equity. So thinking about um, issues issues um, related to uh, broadband access, um, accessibility of materials, open education, and the myriad of other inside the classroom, outside of the classroom infrastructure questions. Um, and in post-secondary education in particular, um, we think that um, technology, when it's applied systematically, um, collaboratively across programs and institutions, can really help address long-standing issues of access, affordability, and success, and profoundly impact outcomes for students that we serve. Um, so with that, um, let's jump into um, um, open education and the big ecosystem that is um, that I guess is the impact of the five R's. Um, and this is a reflection, I think, of how um, the policy programs and funding of the Department of Education has um, been sort of uh, over the last few years has developed. Um, so initially, um, obviously through programs like the TACT program that a lot of, that Daniel referenced and that a lot of you participate in, we created a large number of um, content and resources. Um, we've also focused on um, developing the uh, materials necessary for complete courses that 
that are around um, the content that's open. Um, we've started to think about pathways. Um, like I know that there is a lot of investment outside of the federal government as well as inside on um, like Z degree programs, for example. And then thinking about um, the ecosystem of credentials. Um, um, through some work, through the early success of uh, like all of your work actually um, related to developing content and courses and pathways and credentials, we've been able to um, build some policies in the federal government um, that um, either require, encourage, or enforce the need for educational materials to be that are publicly funded to be available to the public easily. Um, so I, so when we talk about open education ecosystem at the Department of Education, we are thinking about all of these things. Um, we know that our work is primarily in the blue in the policy programs and funding where um, we support the work that all of you are doing um, in the purple boxes, the content courses, pathways and credentials. And I have to apologize. I am not like very artistic. And so this is the highest level of achievement that I will uh, like have on slide design. Um, okay, so, so I'll give you some examples. Um, we mentioned the TACT grant program. Um, Skills Commons is a result of that. Some of the, a lot of the content um, that was created in during that program is still available on um, the skillscommons.org website. Um, and in our existing open textbook pr grant program, and I know that Kim will be presenting later on in this conference, um, we have three main um, investments, the Open RN project, um, the Libra text project, as well as the Open Active Textbooks project that we have currently funded. Um, and just because everyone is probably thinking about this right now, um, Nicole did mention in the chat applications are due on November 16th, which I think is plenty of time to still go to OER karaoke. Um, I think I said that wrong. Um, but essentially, in addition to the textbooks themselves, I think there is an acknowledgement this time that there are actually large gaps that are not just in the content themselves, um, but in bringing sort of whole courses um, into the open education marketplace, providing um, uh, technology-based strategies for personalization, continuous improvement of teaching, promoting student success, um, and again, working in collaboration with other institutions. Um, I'm happy to take specific questions about this, um, either now or in the, or probably not now, but in the Q&A. Um, but yes, we would love for everyone to apply for this grant, which is due on November 16th. Um, so then what do we mean by bigger? If this is actually a lot, right? Just those four things alone um, is entire careers for many of you, which is excellent and thank you for doing that. But when I say bigger, am I saying that you are not doing enough? Um, and I actually want to say that that's not exactly what I mean. Um, but when I say a bigger open education ecosystem at the department, we've started to think a little bit differently about things. So what is the sort of evolution or the the biggest potential of these five R's. So in addition to the content and the delivery of the, the, the resources themselves, like is there a way for us to promote um, experiences for students? Um, if it's just a course um, in one institution, um, what if it was a course in multiple institutions? So what if the experiences could extend across platforms regardless of where um, you are um, currently enrolled and where you will be enrolled later? Um, what if in addition to one pathway um, a lot that, um, towards one goal, you could have multiple pathways um, and that the achievements um, that you have obtained along these pathways could extend across multiple institutions and not even just institutions institutions, but what if they could also extend to um, the achievements that you have um, obtained through your working experience or other sort of life experiences? And what if you could take those achievements in, in form of credentials with you so that you can access opportunities um, throughout your entire life? Um, and part of um, why we think about this bigger open education ecosystem in this way is because more and more, and especially because of this pandemic, we I think that um, it's becoming very, very real that uh, education for, in for individuals is not um, one size fits all. Um, individuals learn over a lifetime. They learn in many different places at many different institutions and in many different types of organizations that provide education. 
Um, and in addition to just um, all of the content being um, free and easily available, we want the experiences not to be locked into one particular platform so that if you transfer to another institution or you learn in a different place, those same types of immersive, personalized, accessible experiences can be available to you there too. Um, so then in that case, we have to ask ourselves the question, like what are the technology standards that we need to enforce in order um, for content to be interoperable? If we want achievements um, to be to um, be mobile with students across institutions or um, their workplace, then we need to start thinking about whether there are open, transparent quality measures, um, so that when courses are evaluated for transfer credit, for example, um, that we know that students have received and we acknowledge that they can have um, achieved um, these same types of skills um, in a different context, and we can allow students to then progress um, without repeating. And if students then have credentials, what are the credentials that have value in either pursuing additional education or in their workplace? And are there ways for us to have um, like ascribe value to these credentials um, so that they have meaning both in the work in for employers and for other educational institutions? And how can we allow it, individuals then to take these credentials with them um, so that they can continue whenever they need? If they need to pause, then that would be fine too. Um, so these are all projects um, that the department is currently investing in and I'll give you uh, and that are we're also very interested in and I'll give you some examples um, of some of these so um, the department is co chairing um, a digital infrastructure working group through the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board that thinks about learning and employment records. Um, pilots that allow you to take um, the skills that you've learned in a workplace and translate them into educational credits or educational credits along a pathway. Um, can be supplemented with and um, lead to um, further employment opportunities um, and, um, and across platforms as well. So if you attend um, one institution that uses a particular LMS, it, you are not limited in the portability of your records through an applicant tracking system at an employer. Um, something like related to that that we're really interested in is something called the Open Skills Network, which is a coalition of um, education providers and employers, etc. Um, that want to create open taxonomies and frameworks for discussing what are skills and what contributes to skills and what skills contribute to credentials so that when someone says I am a software engineer and I'm certified or I'm certified in this trade or I have um, a bachelor's degree in um, molecular biology that has meaning um, and it's a universal language which that allows me then to access my next opportunity, whether it's educational or employment. Um, you know, other really interesting projects, I think, are the Open Syllabus Project, um, and which will, I think, help. I think this is part of um, the session, so I, I, I'm not qualified to talk about it, but I think it's re a really interesting approach. So. Um, this is how we've sort of thought about it when we when we were um, I think creating our CARES Act discretionary grants. Um, and we called it the Reimagining Workforce Preparation Grants. This is a lot of what we thought. Um, this is not a grant that's open right now, but I think that there are still opportunities for you to participate, particularly if you are in one of the seven states that received one of our grants. Um, in all of these states, um, the workforce boards had to partner with employers as well as um, education stakeholders to create short term education and training programs that were along career pathways. Now, because this is one of the discretionary grants um, that are that the Department of Ed issued, um, they are required, all of the materials, all of the courses and training programs are going to be openly licensed according to the regulation. But in addition, we um, introduced a new sort of open requirement, which is that there would be o linked open data on the credentials that um, would be issued. So um, I think there's a link on the bottom of this slide. Um, please feel free to ask me more about these. And um, I think there's contact information as well for um, who you might talk to within some of these states. Um, but I think we're really excited about that. Similarly, we have the Rethink K-12 um, education models where um, states could propose uh, virtual learning and course access programs. Now, again, because these are discretionary grants 
from the Department of Education, they are required to have um, open licenses on any of the materials that they produce. Um, in addition, again, we, we didn't introduce this for K-12 in, um, entities as a requirement, but a strong recommendation, again, that they use linked open data on the credentials that they issue. And I think we'll have the privilege of hearing a little bit more about the Texas project um, in, a, in just a minute. Um, and finally, we have one open funding opportunity. So after you've karaoke'd and um, written your open textbook grant, um, please take a look at the Career Education Pathways Exploration System Program. Sorry, this is a mouthful, but we love the long names. Um, and essentially, it's um, you know technology-based or technology-enabled career and education pathway systems for high school students. Um, now, this isn't a direct high school to post-secondary connection. It could also be a high school to career connection. Um, but it is um, an opportunity for us to partner with a lot of the different projects um, that are ongoing that are related to open data on educational outcomes, on return on investment, um, and um, I think pathways. So the applications are due the 9th. So again, the order is karaoke, open textbook grant, and then look at the career educational pathways exploration system programs. Um, Okay, and so I'll just wrap with saying what is the biggest and I think the biggest is the, the growing community of the five R's. Um, I had a really, um, so the question I want to ask is what if everyone in all of the world had all of the OER that they could ever want? Um, would we have fixed all of the systemic issues that exist in our society, in our education system? And obviously I think the answer is probably no, but I think that OER plays a really critical part in this and I think that like we've talked about it a little bit. Um, and I, I, this is, this, and I want to, um, like, I, I think I'll put a fine point on it by saying it like this. So this is a slide that I presented at Open Ed um, four years ago um, when things were um, also very interesting, right? So November, four years ago, um, where were you? So I was giving this presentation about federal policy on open education. And I gave um, these five bullet points on how people can continue to do this work. Um, I said, in order to, for you to be engaged in national policy, you should do good work and you should do it together. You should tell your story and use lots of data. Um, you should participate in your democracy. Um, you should buy coffee, AKA get to know people that work in the federal um, government. Um, and you should persist and be patient. Um, and I think that now, four years later, I'm not sure I would change very many of the um, talking points. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to, um, I think, so many of you who have known me for the, I think, 12 years that I've been in government that have taught me so much about open education and that have continued to share with me the results of your good work. Um, I think that when the federal government and the, I think, people that are in this, our stakeholders in the field who are actually doing the work um, can talk um, with each other and have um, clearer lines of communication. That is when I think on a national level, we begin to make real impact. And so um, without all of your hard work and um, all of you, um, I think giving me updates on the great things that you are doing, um, telling me and showing me the data um, and helping us um, do this, um, I think we would not have made the progress that we have. Um, and I would continue you know, encourage everyone to continue doing this. Um, there is a new team that is coming to the department. Um, I think many of you have um, seen the list and know that there are some familiar faces. Um, but this isn't to say that um, this, you know, open education will automatically be a priority. Um, I think we have to continue to tell to do the work and tell the stories and to continue to participate by getting to know the new team and to be really patient because I think that um, good things are coming. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over um, to you.